Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a great documentary, and uh, I look forward to seeing the, the rest of it. That's the first piece that I had seen. I uh, read Half the Sky, and I was so afraid that I was going to be um, sad and um, sort of left with um, kind of a, a depressing message, but that didn't happen at all. So one of the first questions I have for you is oh, the title. Tell us about the title. Well, Half the Sky, I think a lot of you who are familiar with China know this uh, saying very well. It comes from women hold up half the sky. And right now, it's mostly a aspiration. But uh, we think that it really captures um, uh, the aspirations of what should be half of the population of the globe. Uh, in Mao's era, of course, he used the term uh, for his own uh, you know, methods, but in many ways it reflects uh, the real reason why we chose it, which is that, you know, in his time, he actually was just looking for ways to increase the economic output of the country. It just wasn't enough to have all, all the men working, and he just needed to uh, boost that, that output so that he could um, outdo the Russians. And so he thought, ah, well, if all the women work, we put them to work, we'll be able to boost the economic output. So that's what he did. And, and that also uh, led to a whole bunch of other things that he did. And obviously he did a lot of things that were not great for the country. But the one thing that was his true legacy is that he did um, say that women could be truck drivers just as men could be truck drivers. And I think that that ended up being a really great um, uh, social benefit for the women in China. So that now in... Uh, the developing world, I think that China is probably one of the best places to be born a woman if, you, if you're looking at the developing world. Absolutely. So in the documentary, uh, there was a little bit of discussion about how you, both of you, began this journey. Could you tell us a little more? I know you're a journalist and you see lots of stories and you cover lots of things. How come this one stuck so well? Well, I have to say that we never... Um, originally embarked on this. This really is, wasn't our specialty. Um, my background is in business, my husband's background is in journalism, and then I actually was a business journalist and covered a lot of um, um, issues, you know, you know, through the lens of business. Uh, but I have to say that over the years, um, and we have covered together between the two of us a very wide range of things. Um, my husband has covered wars, and uh, he's been to Afghanistan and, and to Iraq, and I've covered lots of natural disasters and hijackings and all sorts of things. But um, some of the stories that kept coming back to us really uh, were the stories about the cruelty towards women. Uh, and we really hadn't uh, anticipated writing about this uh, because a lot of the times when we were writing about women's issues, we thought, oh, these are isolated, isolated cases. So for instance, in China, when we discovered that there were 30 million missing females from the Chinese population, we thought, oh, gosh, that's a huge number, but China is always filled with really weird things happening. It's a giant country, very complicated. Nothing is black and white. And so we thought that's just China. And then we moved to Asia and saw lots of things going on in Asia. Um, discrimination, you know, living in Japan, there was very wildly educated um, uh, you know, Japanese women, almost like Dina, <laughs> um, but in, in Korea as well, but they just weren't getting the status in the, in the uh, you know, corporate world or in the, in, in the f uh, world of labor. And in Southeast Asia, there was, uh, was a lot of trafficking. And we thought, my goodness, well, this is just Asia. And then we moved back to the States. Nick started traveling uh, and writing about uh, Africa, and he saw a lot of horrors in, in Africa. And we th began to think, my goodness, this is... This is larger than China, larger than Asia. In fact, it is global. And we started teasing out these, these things that were happening, and that became half the sky. Um, and sort of related to that, sometimes it's easy for us sitting here in the United States and in other uh, resource-rich countries to look over there and say, yes, well, they have their problems. Of course, they would. So. Are th is it really a difference in kind, or is it just a question of spectrum? And a lot of what I was seeing in the documentary was connected to patriarchy. So is it a spectrum that you see? I mean, trafficking goes on right here too, right? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, Dina. In fact, it does go on here. We have problems here at home that we do need to address as well. I think it probably is a matter of degree. Uh, I would say that while trafficking and, unfortunately, rape is not a foreign event, it's also a domestic event, uh, all these things go on uh, here. 
I would have to say though that the brutality that you know we know of abroad is is of a level that is just of a different dimension. I mean, there is just a cruelty that you just don't see here. Um, you know, one of uh, the women that you didn't see in the trafficking segment, which actually I know that they wanted to show you because it is very relevant because of the trafficking issues here um, in Houston, but I hope you will watch it on October 1st or 2nd. Um, in that segment, uh, we do uh, meet a woman. Uh, um, uh, her original name is Long Cross, and we changed, uh, well, she has changed her name too, but she was uh, uh, kidnapped uh, from a rural vill village brought to you know, Phnom Penh in, and put into a brothel, and she was forced to work seven days a week. Uh, she's not paid a cent. Uh, I mean, that's kind of like slavery. I mean, I just, you know, what else do you call it? And she wasn't even fed that much. They didn't want her to get fat. I mean, and they beat her when she was not obedient. In fact, uh, she got pregnant twice and had an abortion twice. And then the second time she was feeling miserable. So the brothel owner, who happened to be a woman, when Long Cross resisted, uh, the brothel owner gouged out her eye. So there's just a level of brutality that is much more flippant or just, you know, it courses throughout, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the society um, in some of these places. And so it is quite um, horrific, but definitely it, there are issues here that have to be resolved as well. Is this brutality, do you think, a question of the economic situation broadly so that people might be forced to become brutal because of their own lack of opportunity? I don't think that it's um, really economic. I, I do think that it's, you know, um, if you look back in history, uh, from the days of Alexander the Great, and I'm looking way, way back, but you know, in that era, um, it was an achievement to kill your first man at age 12. Uh, you went through the Middle Ages, you know, the dueling was a, a, nat uh, was a pr common practice in the US. We have become a much less violent world. Uh, but some places are not as, you know, uh, not as educated, uh, and they aren't as, um, you know, uh, respectful of human rights. And those are these places in the, in the developing world that we're talking about where uh, there is real brutality. And thankfully, it isn't here. Uh, I mean, obviously, there is brutality here in the U.S. as well, uh, a lot more than we would ever want. But we are much less violent than some of these other places. And so I think that's mainly a part of it. Um, as far as the um, institutional obstacles to change or the, the institutional variables that promote this sort of thing. I was interested to see that w one of the moms didn't want her daughter to go. The, the second girl who was in school, she wanted her to stay. So what are some of the things that work to keep this going? Well, that cycle. It's just a, a tradition. And so, for instance, you're talking about Monisha's mother. Um, you know, she's torn. I mean, uh, you know, in some ways she doesn't want her daughter to go to school because her family doesn't want her daughter to go to school. But then again, she also knows that if she brings Monisha back that, you know, she probably is going to end up being sold. So, um, and they need the money and, you know, it's, it's she doesn't think it, it's just something that she's lived with an all generation after generation in her, in her family and in her village. Um, so I do think that it, it takes a long time and it takes a lot, a big effort to break out these traditions, but uh, a lot of it just takes education, it really does. So Monisha, she's gonna be educated, she is going to think a w just completely differently from her mother. And that's what it takes, it takes educating a generation of, of men and women. Uh, and so if uh, you can, you obviously can do it at, you know, at the, at the person by person level, uh, the way Ermi Basu is doing it. But uh, writ large, you really do need to involve the government. The government needs to step in. You know, education really ought to be a, a government, um, you know, public good. It really is very necessary for them to take a role in that. And so uh, the real challenge is to be uh, able to convince uh, officials that this is important. I think that is happening in Cambodia. Uh, uh, so while there is trafficking a lot in Cambodia, as you would you'll see in the, in the uh, trafficking segment, uh, the government is taking steps. They understand that, uh, that education is very important. And for them, they see, at the end of the rainbow, they see a pot of gold through you know, a flourishing economy. And that is the way it works. I mean, I think that if you can convince governments that educated girls, not just, it's not education for the sake of education, it really is that they actually will help contribute to the national economy. 
Yeah, and that's, that's great. So can you talk a little bit about the causality behind that? I know that when you, when you empower women, everybody does better, but what's really happening there? What, what actually happens? Well, it's really, really important. I mean, if you look at what happened to China in many ways, that's kind of a role model for the developing world. Um, what China did was, in addition to be able to, to Mao said, okay, women can work in the workplace, they are allowed to work. What that did was um, it set the groundwork. So the communists said, we need to educate everyone, including girls. So that meant that girls can go to school. It was very accepted. I mean, it was mandatory education. They said, we know that education is very important uh, for um, our society. Now, part of that is because of the respect for education that the Confucian uh, countries actually uh, hold. Uh, but what was different about China is that they also said it's very, uh, we're very welcoming that uh, the women can actually join the formal labor force. And that was critical because it wasn't so true in Korea and Japan, but it was very true in China. They said not only can these women be educated, but they can work in the formal labor force, which meant that women actually could work in factories. And I say that I really think that, that was the best thing that happened in China because when you think back to what started their economic revolution, it was apparel, it was light apparel. It was these women in these factories making our clothes, our shoes, our bags, our toys. They were in those factories because they wanted the women's very agile small fingers. So they basically jump-started China's entire economic revolution. You can say that. And so I think that um, if you could have other developing countries follow that model where you, know, you educate the women, hopefully there will be industrialization that follows, um, you know, uh, so that it's not purely agriculture, uh, then I think that there's um, really great promise. But you need an educated workforce. You need to be able to read, write, and just defend yourself so that you don't get, you know, get hoodwinked all the time. You just need to be able to count your money and, and do the basics uh, uh, in order to run your own sort of, even if it's a small uh, family-run business. Do you find that um, those who want to maintain the status quo use things like tradition and religion and Oh, absolutely. And I think that, you know, it's not that we're saying, you know, Westerners should go into another culture and say this is how it's done, because often we just don't know how things are done. However, um, there are certain practices, if we find they're so offensive, um, chances are very good that there are people in the local communities who find them very offensive, but just don't have the guts to voice their opposition. So if you can align with those small groups that are trying to change the culture, you can really bring about change. And believe me, some of the stuff that you think that is just so cultural and that they want it really is something they don't want. If you go to Africa, places in Africa, for instance, female cutting has been something that for decades the West has been complaining about, saying it's ho horrible. You know, they've been trying all different ways to get to, to bring about change. And they haven't been successful until this one tiny NGO run by Molly Melching called Tostan, you know, stumbled upon, I mean, after many, many mistakes, she stumbled upon a really great method. And, and that is that she works with local partners. She found local organizations, who d local groups who didn't like this practice at all. And she says they are the ones who, who guide her. She gives them the resources. Uh, she helps prepare the training materials and everything. But they, you know, they basically um, guide her and, and basically lead the way in terms of bringing about change. And she's there as the advocate and as the as the support person, she discovered that, um, I remember it was very interesting, I was with her and she had this imam, you know, who's, you know, 80 years old, this old man who had been, you know, proselytizing, you know, his, his religion for decades, and all of a sudden his, na his niece was complaining about having to be cut. And he thought, my goodness, my niece is complaining about this. And he sort of thought about it, this, and he thought, hmm, he went to all the other more senior religious figures and asked them, is this part of the religion or is it just something we've been doing all these years? And they said, it's not really in the religion. I mean, it's not in any you know, um, scriptures that I have. And so he said, well, if it's not in the religion, then I don't like this. So he has been going village to village, proselytizing against it. And what they've now done is they actually realize that if you train the key thing is that, um, and there's so many cognates in this with other, uh, overturning other practices. Um, the key thing is that the men don't want to marry women who are not 
cut. So what she discovered, she and her colleagues discovered, is that um, they have to train the young men to, to tell them that it's actually good to marry women who are not cut. And if the men grow up like that, then they will support the girls not being cut. And so that's what she does. They, they start training sessions. They get the young men and women as young as they can <laughs> uh, and start you know, trying to you know, teach them uh, about health care, about uh, all sorts of things. And um, she's been very successful. So these are a lot of taboo things. And, it, and I was struck how in the book and also in the documentary, there's a willingness, you guys bring it out, they seem to want to tell you things. How, how is that? Oh, there's some other segments you know, on this cutting, which is you know, really um, pretty, um, I know, hard to talk about, but you will find some amazing revelations. I mean, just that show you really what, if you sort of peel away at the onion, you can see what the practice is all about. It's, it, it really, um, uh, you know, is it's not this cultural, deeply bel believed thing. It's just something that people don't think much about, and they do. And there are entrenched stakeholders who like to perpetrate it because they have some investment in it. As with you know all sorts of traditions, so um, it's very interesting, and I'm. It, it is amazing how open people were, uh, and um, we were very lucky that they talked to the camera. Were you ever scared? In the one scene where the, the brothel owners came out and cut down the... I was not at that scene. That was Nick. Um, I have to say that that was um, very scary. Uh, uh, that was scary. Um, but, you know, nothing is really... Um, foreigners who go in for a few days, there really isn't much risk to foreigners. The real risk is to uh, the locals. The real risk is to the local... Um, the people in India, uh, the people in Cambodia, the people in Sierra Leone, in Kenya, it's really them who are risking their lives to bring about change in the worlds around them. So, you know, you know, it's really not on us at all. Um, changing the topic a little bit, but um, the American women's movement has done amazing things here in the United States. Do you think that that particular group, if it is a cohesive group, has a responsibility to pay more attention to the global sisters and advocate for that? I don't know if it's a responsibility. I just think that it's in everybody's interest to help out a little bit. I think that there are many reasons that people, uh, you know, might want to help. Uh, you know, I just think that you find an issue that you care about uh, because I think if you're interested in an issue, then you'll spend more time on it. You'll bring others along. You're more passionate about it. It's something that, you know, you like to do. Uh, and you also feel good about it, and if you feel good, in fact, there is research that says, you know, if you're happy, you live longer, so <laughs> if you do something you like to do and you're happy, you might live longer, so. Sabrina, would you like me to, okay. Uh, now it's your turn. You get to ask questions. So uh, if, you, if you identify yourself, I will get a microphone to you. No, microphone's coming. Hi, my name is Sujin. First of all, it's a great pleasure to be with the great role models and pioneers of the women for our generation. And my question is something that you mentioned about educating the other half of the sky when it comes to prostitution demands, and especially when you think about human trafficking, when it's really big here in Houston and it's big in Southeast Asia where richer Asian men go there to buy the women. And when you were investigating into this, have you ever come across a great idea how to educate the other half of the sky and the other men? Right. Well, you know, a lot of it has to do with um, how you manage how you manage it. And it's educating everybody. I mean, it is true that you just need to educate everybody uh, in a very enlightened way. Uh, it's educating boys and girls, men and women. Um, as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, a lot of the perpetrators of violence are not men. It's it's women. Um, so it's not men against women. It really isn't. Um, you know, surprisingly, a large number of the, you know, brothel owners are women. It's because they start out in the business and then they, their dream was to own their own brothel and then, you know, you know, pay back the hostility that was, you know, given to them to someone else. So, uh, unfortunately, that is, that is the case as well. But I do think that you have to educate everyone. I also think that you have to change the incentives. You said, yes, um, there is a demand. Well, um, there's demand and so, 
uh, you've got to figure out a way how to how to temper that, how to change and alter that demand. Um, there are a couple of ways. Um, one is that if you look at the way Sweden versus a Amsterdam have actually managed the sex trade, um, Amsterdam said let's legalize it, and so now it's flourishing. <laughs> I mean, there's just still tons. It's just multiplied, and it hasn't been a, it has not been a success. If you look at Sweden, um, they said zero tolerance, and we're going to prosecute the Johns. So we're going to actually, you know, go on the demand side of things. And they actually had much more success. success. Um, and I say the incentives because this is a business. Um, the people who run it are doing it because they're making money. So you need to change the incentives. And I'll tell you a little bit of a little story about Cambodia. Um, it's not in the film, but uh, we had been talking to a brothel owner who Nick had interviewed a few times um, before. And she was complaining over the years because, you know, the, you know, the, the um, uh, Cambodia's been criticized so much for it. And so there have been, like, periodic crackdowns. And, you know, they are trying, the authorities are trying to do something about it. And so the result was that in this very tiny city in the northern part of Cambodia, uh, where it was very far from Phnom Penh, very far from the capital, but it was still, uh, there had been this crackdown nationally. And so the um, bribe price, the price to bribe a policeman was going up. In other words, for him to turn a blind eye, you had to pay him more because there was more risk for him. The bribe price was going so high, so high up, that the brothel owner said, it was getting so unprofitable for me to run my business that I shut down my brothel and opened a grocery store. <laughs> so that's what we need is higher bribe prices, right? <laughs>
um, you know, it may not be all that bad to partner with the education ministry. I mean, after all, they have done, they have been quite successful at what they do, and they, they should find ways to be able to work with you if you're going to bring in money to help them or whatever you are, you know, you're bringing a, a certain kind of um, approach to education maybe. I don't, I don't know exactly what you're doing, but I would think there might be some common ground for the two of you to work on that because otherwise I think it is going to be difficult. My name is Pam Perot, and I work with an NGO, a women's I- uh, international NGO. My question is actually two parts. Of course, your book has been out for a while. It's a great book. Um, but what do you feel is the most important thing that has come from your book, yourself? And the second question is what is the most surprising thing that has come f- from the publication of your book? Thank you. Well, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think that um, on the one hand, well, I think that we've become a much less violent world and culture, I think that the one area where we have not made as much progress is in uh, the um, is in the attitudes towards women. There's still abuse, hatred, uh, there's wife burnings and, you know, <laughs> um, uh, wife beatings. It's really pretty horrific. So I think that that is one area that I hope that uh, with not only the book but also the film and then also there's going to be a Facebook game as well on this issue. I hope that with that it will help um, educate people about these issues and then um, prompt them to care enough to join a small movement, whatever it is, that's a rolling movement, an incipient movement, to actually try and bring about change in attitudes. And what I like about this um, this topic is that you don't have to dedicate your life. I do not dedicate my life to this. I you know, have to have a day job. I mean, we're not asking anybody to give up their life. But um, if they could actually just devote a tiny portion of their time, you know, maybe it starts out with 10 minutes a week or, you know, an hour a month or something like that, uh, to sort of delve into these issues. Uh, Then they'll learn a lot about it, and then they'll feel, hey, I think I have these skills, and I think I should be able to help in this way. And I think that's what we're hoping, is that, you know, it takes a movement to really bring about a real change, because you have to affect policy, and you need, you know, voters to actually tell their politicians that, uh, this is what we care about. It's an issue we care about. It so we want you to vote ec- this way on the Violence Against Women's Act or whatever. So I do think that that's um, something that I do um, would like to see as a result of um, uh, these efforts. Hi, I'm Andrew Edmondson. Uh, I know that Hillary Clinton has a long history of working to empower women and girls, and I remember I think reading that the Bush administration was actually, because of evangelical fervor around the issue, very committed to trying to address this. Could you talk about recent administrations' recognition of the problem and how effective U.S. foreign policy can be at making change happen? Right. Well, I think the Bush administration was excellent in terms of its PEPFAR program in terms of having to address the um, AIDS uh, challenges in Africa. I mean, it was probably one of the most successful uh, foreign policy, uh, you know, um, initiatives uh, in the Bush administration. And, uh, you know, I do think that foreign policy, particularly when it comes to U.S. US AID, U.S. aid, I mean, right now, people think, oh, my goodness, there's so much money being spent on it. It's like less than 1% of the U.S. budget that goes to f- U.S. AID, so it's really tiny. Um, but it goes very, very far. Um, in fact, you know, a dollar abroad in Africa goes so much farther <laughs> than a dollar here. I mean, it re- you really can bring about a, a lot of change, and there is um, a lot needed in those areas, so that's what I would say. Oh, I mean, I guess if you w- want to talk about foreign policy more broad, I mean, what Hillary Clinton has done in terms of raising the issue of women, the status of women in as she goes about her foreign policy, when she goes to Pakistan, she always meets with uh, a group of, of Pakistani women or women in India, or she went to Goma, the rape capital of the world in Congo. I don't think any Secretary of State has ever set foot in Goma. So she's done a remarkable job in terms of elevating the issue and, and the challenge, and I think that's, that's been really critical. Yes, hello, my name is Robert. Um, given the way the world is evolving over here, uh, have you looked into the interface between the women's problems that you're seeing and, for example, third world lesbian women 
or have any of the lesbian movements here involved themselves with you all? And as a, as a corollary to that, have you looked at all into the issue of trafficking in boys, or is it strictly from the female side that you have approached this? Thank right, you. on those two counts I have not, but that doesn't mean that it's not an important issue, both of them, but it's just not something that you know we have had the resources to look into. So, but you know, I, I know that there are a lot of people who have looked into those issues. Our, our last question. Um, my name is Susan Boggio, and I'm very interested in this fantastic book that I read some years ago and still recall, as I told you, uh, reading chapters of it on a plane, crying a little bit, and then that intrigued my seatmates, whereupon they started reading the book <laughs> and said, I've got to get this book. Uh, could you tell the audience and myself a little bit more about your Half the Sky Foundation? I think that's amazing work that you're doing, and we haven't heard about all the good work that you're doing. Oh, actually, that Half the F Sky Foundation is different from what we do. We do not have a foundation. Uh, that Half the Sky Foundation actually is, is very interesting because they started off helping orphan girls. And um, they've done a great job in you know, helping um, orphan girls find homes in the US or, or outside of China. And they've you know, helped build schools also for orphan girls in, in China as well. Um, we decided not to build our own foundation. I mean, there are just so many foundations, wonderful foundations and NGOs uh, around that it's just not our expertise. Um, I have to say, we are not field experts. And so really, the field experts deserve all of the credit. I mean, we are just the messenger. <laughs> um, we, will, we can tell their stories, but I, you know, they deserve the credit because they're the ones in the field day in, day out, who are actually bringing about the change. And we really just um, are just trying to spread their, uh, the work that they've done. That, that's good to know, because I thought, after I Googled it, that that was your foundation, too. And they do, they're doing wonderful things for girls. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, are. I did the same thing, and I thought, yeah. wow, they're doing babies, too. This is I great. know. <laughs> it's okay. amazing. Know. They were focusing on education and helping anyway. It, it sounded like a really great thing. <laughs> OK. Please, a big round of applause. Thank you so much for being with us this evening.